Okay, thanks a lot for, for the invitation. Uh, this is joint work with, with Enrique Mendoza. There is a growing consensus on the need to use macroprudential policies to manage systemic risk in financial markets. In particular, there's a widespread view that there's a need to contain great expansion during boom times to make the economy less vulnerable to a financial crisis. This new view about financial regulation is indeed supported by, by an empirical literature that documents the link between credit booms and, and financial crisis, and also by a theoretical literature that highlights some of the market failures in, in financial markets that lead to some form of excessive risk taking and, and require uh, macro prudential policies. Now, there are various challenges uh, for, for the quantitative literature on, on macro prudential policy. So first, uh, we would like to have a, a nonlinear model of systemic risk that is able to produce crisis in the model that looks like crisis within the data. In this sense, we would have a, a good laboratory to think about how policies can affect uh, risk taking in the economy and, uh, and the vulnerability to crisis. Second, we want to study uh, fully optimal policies and perhaps compare also with, with simple implementable rules. And third, we want to address uh, time inconsistency issues that have been uh, uh, abstracted in, basically in the, in the literature. And just like time inconsistency typically plays an important role in monetary or fiscal policy, we think this is potentially also an important issue in, in macro prudential policy. So what we're going to do in this paper is, is build a model to try to address these three challenges. Uh, the, the key feature of the model is going to be a, a collateral constraint uh, linked to uh, the prices of the assets. And it's going to have two basic features. First, when, when this collateral constraint binds in the economy, this is going to trigger a fire sales. And it's going to reduce uh, the credit available to firms. And it's going to produce a recession. The second feature is, is a pecuniary externality, similar to the work that, for example, Guido has done, where uh, agents are not going to internalize how their borrowing decisions affect asset prices, which in turn affect the borrowing capacity in the economy. In the context of this model, we're going to characterize optimal macroprudential policy. We're going to study the timing consistency problem of, of the financial regulator. And we're also going to compare the time consistent solution with simple implementable policy rules. So we're going to find that uh, a state contingent tax on debt is going to be a sufficient instrument to implement what we're going to call the constraint efficient allocations. Um, we're also going to show that the macro prudential policy is going to suffer from a very subtle timing consistency problem, which is going to arise because anticipated marginal utilities of consumption are going to affect current asset prices and the collateral constraint in the economy. So whenever this collateral constraint becomes binding in the economy, the planner would like to reduce the future path of consumption, increasing future marginal utilities, and propping up current asset prices. Exposed, however, the planner is not longer going to internalize how reductions in, in current consumption are going to have positive effects on, on previous periods. And that's basically the source of, of time inconsistency. Quantitatively, we're going to find that uh, optimal macroprudential policy under discretion is going to achieve a significant reduction in, in financial fragility. Big reductions in the probability of a crisis, big, collapse, uh, big differences in terms of uh, reductions in asset prices, and also significant reductions in, in risk premium. Quantitatively, the tax on, on debt is going to be 1% on average. And it's going to fluctuate significantly along the business cycle. In particular, it's going to be increasing on, on leverage. Another important result is that if we restrict the planner to use simpler taxes, in particular time invariant taxes, they're going to be, on average, welfare gains. But if, this, if these policies are implemented during crisis, then these are going to have contractionary effects and are going to be welfare reducing. So there's a literature. Uh, there are people here like uh, Guido and Gianluca have made important contributions. Uh, let me skip that in the interest of time. 
So I'm going to start with a, a very simple model to illustrate the pecuniary externality and the time inconsistency problem. And later I will enrich the model and, and take it to the data. So in, in, in this environment, there's going to be a, a continuum of, of identical households. They maximize expected lifetime utility. And they have uh, a stock KT of, of, of risky assets. Okay? These assets are going to be in fixed supply on aggregate. Uh, agents are going to have some, some bonds. So minus BT here represents that. So at the beginning of the period, agents are going to be trading the, the risky assets, the bond, and are going to be buying uh, or issuing new bonds, buying capital goods and consumption. The key feature that is going to introduce systemic risk in the economy is this mark-to-market collateral constraints that limits uh, total borrowing to a fraction of the market value of the assets. Okay. This is going to be a, an occasionally binding collateral constraint. Um, and you'll see it's going to be kind binding when there's sufficient leverage in the, in the economy. Now I'm going to make a, a simplification. I'm going to assume that the borrowing capacity actually depends on the uh, aggregate value of the assets. Okay? This is, this is for, for, to simplify the algebra. Then later when I go to the quantitative analysis, you'll see later the KT there. Okay? I'm going to use mu t here to denote the, the shadow value from, from relaxing the collateral constraint. So if you uh, combine the Euler equations for bonds and capital, you get an excess return that is going to have two terms. The second term is the covariance term, which is very standard in, in asset pricing models. And there's also the mu t, which is the shadow value from relaxing the, the collateral constraint. What it says is that every time the constraint binds, the shadow uh, return on bonds is going to go up. And this implies that there's going to be a, an increase in the expected return on capital, which in turn is going to reduce asset prices. And, and through this uh, mark-to-market collateral constraint, it's going to feed back again to the, um, to the collateral constraint. The key externality here is going to arise because agents are going to take the, these asset prices given, and they will not internalize how their ex-ante borrowing decisions affect the market price of, of capital and in turn affect the, the borrowing capacity of the overall economy. So this is the classic pecuniary externality. For the normative analysis, I'm going to uh, start with a constraint efficient regulator. It's going to choose directly the amount of debt in the economy and it's going to do some lump sum taxes or transfers to the households. Households are going to receive this these transfers, and they're going to choose consumption and their asset holdings. So the asset market here is going to remain competitive. I'm going to start with the assumption that, that the planner cannot commit to future borrowing policies. I will later show you the problem uh, under commitment as well. So this is the problem that households face in the constraint efficient equilibrium. They're going to maximize lifetime utility and choose their consumption and their holdings of, of, of risky assets. The optimality condition here with respect to, to the asset holdings uh, gives rise to this asset price condition. And this is going to be the key implementability constraint for, for the planner. So this is the planner's problem uh, under discretion. The planner is going to take as given future policies for consumption, for bonds, and, and asset prices. And it's going to solve this Bellman equation, where you see basically that the, that the constraints for the planner are the, the resource constraint, the uh, collateral constraint, and, and now the asset price basically is going to be given by, uh, by the asset pricing condition of, of households. Now the difference here in this problem is that the planner will basically internalize how changes in, in bonds or changes in consumption are going to affect uh, the asset price, which in turn affect the, the collateral constraint. So in a Markov perfect equilibrium, the, the choices of the planner have to be consistent with the expectations about future policies. Now let me show you the, the optimality conditions for, for this planner's problem. 
So you have to remember basically these three Greek letters, lambda, mu, and, and psi t. Psi t here is the Lagrange multiplier on the, on the implementability constraint. So for, for the planner, the planner is going to equate basically the, the shadow value of wealth to the marginal utility of consumption minus this additional term. What is that additional term? Well, that is going to reflect precisely how a change in consumption affects the, the, the implementability constraint. Now, what's the sign of psi t? Well, the sign of psi t, you can see from, from this condition, that has exactly the same sign as the shadow value from relaxing the collateral constraint. What that means is that every time the collateral constraint binds, the planner is going to have a higher uh, shadow value of wealth. It's going to value wealth more than uh, agents in the competitive equilibrium. And the, there's also an Euler equation for, for bonds for the planner. And the, the terms you see here are basically the derivatives of the policy functions with respect to current choices. Because this is a problem under commitment, uh, under discretion, sorry. The planner cannot uh, choose future policies, but it can influence future policies. It can influence future policies by changing the state variables of, of next period planner. Now let me compare now the, the Euler equation for bonds in the, in the decentralized equilibrium with the planner's problem. So in the decentralized equilibrium, we have a standard Euler equation when the constraint does not bind. And now for the planner, we have an additional term here, which captures precisely how uh, one unit of savings tomorrow, one unit of saving today, increase consumption tomorrow, and in turn affects asset prices and the, uh, and the collateral constraint. You can see that this, this, this term here is, is always positive, and in particular is strictly positive whenever there is a positive probability of a binding constraint. Now, a, a, a proposition that can be proved is that the constraint-efficient equilibrium can be decentralized with a state contingent tax on debt with a tax revenue rebated lump sum. And not surprisingly, the tax basically is going to be the term I just showed you, normalized by the uh, expected marginal utility of consumption. And there are also a variety of other policies like capital requirements or reserve requirements that can be shown to implement exactly the same allocations. Now, let me briefly compare the time consistent solution with the, with the commitment solution. So what you see here are the, uh, the optimality conditions, again, with respect to consumption, asset prices, and bond positions. And you have this term in red, which is exactly like the one that shows up in the, in the time consistent solution. Increasing consumption today relaxes the implementability constraint today. But now there's other term in blue that tells you that if I increase consumption today, it actually lowers asset prices yesterday. And this tightened the implementability constraint yesterday. So that is the source here of time, time, time inconsistency. A promise of low consumption tomorrow would, may not be credible precisely because the planner would not longer internalize those those benefits over previous periods. Now I'm going to enrich the model because I want to have a model that there's some spillovers from the financial sector to the real side. I want to introduce production decisions and have a model where there's, again, some link between uh, the, the amount of credit and, and the real side. So the way I'm going to do this is by considering a representative firm household that now is going to choose labor with GHA preferences, is going to choose uh, imported inputs, which are this term nu t, and it's going to be subject to a, a collateral constraint that limits not only the one period bonds, but also a fraction of the purchases of imported inputs to the market value of, of assets. The idea here is that there's some timing issue that firms have to buy imported inputs before they produce. And so they are going to borrow in advance, and they are subject to uh, this collateral constraint. Now, what happens in this economy? Well, when this collateral constraint becomes binding, this is going to increase the shadow cost from, from buying imported inputs, which in turn is going to feed back 
to, to the real side, because now production is going to decrease. It's, it's going to reduce consumption. And this, in turn, will affect asset prices and the tightness of the collateral constraint. Here, we also introduce financial shocks, because we think this, plays, this played an important role in the, in the financial crisis, but are not, uh, are not crucial for the analysis. OK, so I'm going to go very fast in the calibration, because I really want to get to the, to the results. But we look here at industrialized economies. Uh, we calibrate, basically, the TFP and interest rate shocks uh, as a vector that are regressive. We uh, calibrate the financial shocks to get the right frequency and duration of financial crisis in the data. And the rest is pretty much standard from a typical RBC model. OK, so here is the bond policy function for, for the decentralized equilibrium. You see this V-shape here. Uh, this point over here is the level of bonds today, such that the collateral constraint <coughs> holds with equality, but it does not bind. So here is the borrowing capacity of the economy, which is a, a decreasing function of, of the bond position. As I move to the right, the economy has little debt. That implies high asset prices, and therefore a high ability to borrow. Oh, sorry. So B bar is the borrowing capacity, sorry. Uh, this B bar is, is Q times K, K times kappa. Okay, if there was no collateral constraint, you would see basically uh, an increasing policy function. If I have more bonds today, I will have more bonds tomorrow. Now, in this region, I have a lot of debt. I would like to borrow more, but I cannot. In fact, I have to cut down on borrowing because asset prices are, are collapsing in this, in this region. Now, let's look at what happens for the planner. I want you to focus attention here on this, on this gray region, which is the area where there is a positive probability of hitting a crisis in the next period. In this area, the planner is relatively more cautious than, than, than households. So it borrows uh, significantly less than, than households. As we go to the right, then the probability of a crisis is something very distant in the future. And that leads, basically, to uh, a smaller differences in, in these decision rules. What happens to the left? Well, in this area, both the planner and households are, are constrained. They, they are still different because of two reasons. First, asset prices naturally are different in the two in the two locations, because uh, future consumption paths are different, and that leads to difference in, in current asset prices today. In addition, the planner may want to allocate less of the borrowing capacity to bonds and more to imported inputs. And, and that basically leads here to um, a bit more borrowing for, for the planner. Now let me illustrate this point further. Here you see the, the bond decision rules in case of a good shock. If there's a good shock, this uh, policy function is going to be increasing in, in current bonds. The point you see here is intersects a 45 degree line, which means that if I start there, tomorrow I will also have exactly the same bond position. What happens now when there's a negative shock? Well, now asset prices are going to collapse because everybody is trying to sell their assets. To, to, um, to repay their debt. And that leads to a very sharp uh, deleveraging. Now, let's look at the planner's bond policy function. This is, again, this is in the good state. What you see here is that the planner, starting at the same, at the same point, basically, would borrow less, which implies that tomorrow it will be uh, less vulnerable to to a, a negative shock because it, it is less leveraged. So when the, exactly the same shock hits the economy, now you see a smaller deleveraging because this, the fact that the economy has less leverage mitigates the fall in, in asset prices. Now, this is a long-run simulation where you can see how crisis look like in the model. Uh, time t here represents an average of uh, of, of financial crisis in the model. And this, in this window analysis, you can see that before the crisis hits at time t, the economy has a 
has a level of credit that is above the, the mean values. And when the crisis hits, there are big drops in output, big drops in consumption, and big drops in asset prices. Now, what happens for the planner? If I give the planner exactly the same sequence of shocks, and I start the planner at the same state variables, here, again, they start at exactly the same level of credit, you can see that the planner, because of, of prudential reasons, it starts accumulating less credit. And then when this negative shock hits, you see a very slow uh, deleveraging, very, very mild. There are still drops in asset prices and output and consumption, but they are much lower than for the decentralized equilibrium. Let me show you a few results on asset pricing. Here you see the distribution of, of asset returns for the decentralized equilibrium and constraint efficient equilibrium. You can see that there is a fat tail in asset returns in the decentralized equilibrium. These are episodes uh, where there are crises and there are big drops in, in asset prices. Because the planner is borrowing less, you, do, you see very, very mild uh, drops in, in, in asset returns. And this fat tail in the distribution of asset returns is also going to lead to significant differences in risk premium um, during good times. So what you see here are the, the volatility of asset returns, risk premium, asset prices, and expected return on assets fixing the shocks, and varying the current bond holdings. Now, this region over here is a region where the economy has a lot of debt, although the constraint is not currently binding. In this area, the economy is, 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 is fairly exposed to, to a crisis, and that leads to a sharp increase in volatility. And there's also a sharp increase in risk premium. Okay, these are episodes where there's, there's this high probability of a crisis, and that, is, that shows up in, in, in risk premium and, and volatility. Now, what happens for the planner? Now, the planner in this area, again, is borrowing less, and that naturally reduces the volatility, and it also reduces the risk premium. What happens in the panels below? Well, actually, asset prices turn out to be lower for the planner, and expected returns are higher. Why is that the case? Well, think about here the, in terms of the decentralization. The planner is taxing borrowing. What that means is that now agents are going to require a higher return to be willing to invest in assets. That rises expected returns and reduces asset prices. So in terms of mean statistics, let me just emphasize differences in, in the mean of the risk premium for the two economies, and uh, changes in expected returns. Now, I show you that the crisis look different for the planner and for the competitive equilibrium. Now, what are the kind of taxes that we need to, to implement these the, this constraint efficient allocations? Well, that's what you see here. If you want to implement the constraint efficient allocations, this is the tax that you need. It's a tax that is increasing. Uh, prior to the crisis, as leverage is building up, it goes to zero during a crisis, and then it goes up again. What about welfare? So this would be the welfare gains of, of switching from the competitive equilibrium to the planner's allocations. So this is how much agents are willing to pay at every state of nature to switch to the, to the planner's allocation. It reaches a peak prior to the crisis of 0.1 percentage points, and again, this is for every period. Then it falls during a crisis, because at the crisis there's not much the planner can do, and then it goes up again. What about time invariant taxes? I mean, there's a big discussion going on about whether we need uh, counter-cyclical capital requirements, or perhaps we just need to increase the buffers. Uh, and, and here is the, the results that we find. If you put a fixed tax across all states of nature, that clearly reduces the probability of a crisis. 
because there's less leverage in the economy. Now, of course, what we care is about welfare, and that's what you see here. The black line here would be the, the average welfare gain for the optimal state contingent tax. Now, these are the gains that you obtain using just a fixed tax. Okay, notice that you can still obtain relatively important gains, but then they come down very quickly. In fact, if I show you the minimum, the minimum gain, this actually turns to be very negative. What this tells you is that if I were to implement this fixed tax uh, during a crisis, then I would get very, very large welfare losses. Okay? Why? Because as soon as you tax debt, that is going to have a contractionary effect on, on asset prices. And this can make the, the crisis even worse. So the timing here is very important. Now, in terms of how the fixed tax compared to uh, the optimal tax, you can see here that there are still some, some important differences in how, how crisis look like. Okay? This green line would be the, the fixed tax. OK, so what uh, we presented today was a, a model for uh, optimal macroprudential policy. We show that there is a, an important timing consistency problem that arises. And we show that under discretion, the planner can significantly reduce the amount of financial fragility in the economy. Uh, we also show that constant taxes uh, can be effective, but they, they are also problematic if they are implemented during, during crisis. Thank you. I would say this is a really state-of-the-art paper that examines the design of uh, macroprudential policy. And here, macroprudential policy has to be intended as a tax on borrowing or a tax on debt. Uh, the paper provides an analytical characterization in terms of this uh, optimal uh, time consistent tax policy, and then also uh, delivers a quantitative uh, analysis of its implication. Uh, and let me summarize here the, the key findings. First of all, uh, there is this idea that uh, private agents in the uh, unregulated economy borrow too much compared to uh, the social planner in uh, normal times, so in times in which uh, the constraint is not binding. Uh, then the other key finding is that uh, uh, this uh, uh, optimal state contingent tax on debt reduces the incidence and also the magnitude of the crisis. And uh, when, uh, uh, that's what Javier show towards the end, when you use a constant tax, then uh, you reduce the frequency of the, of the crisis, but uh, this uh, is less effective in terms of addressing the severity of the crisis. Now, how uh, this is done? And uh, this is done in a context of uh, a very uh, simple but rich uh, class of models. And uh, this is essentially uh, can be thought as a small open economy uh, here, it's a very simple way in which you can characterize heterogeneity. You think about an economy that borrows from the rest of the world, and the interest rate is taken as given. And the key aspect of the paper of this class of model is to have occasionally binding uh, borrowing constraint. Why this is interesting? This is interesting because uh, there is a natural way through this uh, occasionally binding borrowing constraint to think about normal state in which the constraint is not binding, and crisis state in which the constraint binds and there is the amplification mechanism that Javier discussed that makes uh, the economy uh, contract um, in a sharp way. Now, the key aspect, uh, both in terms of positive analysis, so in terms of delivering this amplification effect, and also in terms of the scope for policy, is given by the presence of a key market price in the borrowing constraint. So the key market price here is the price of uh, the asset, which is in fixed supply. And uh, the scope for policy intervention is uh, due to this uh, pecuniary externality or systemic externality that stems from the presence of the key market price in the borrowing constraint. 
So why it is interesting to study this class of model? As I said, from a positive point of view, there is a AR paper by Enrique that has been uh, successful in uh, showing how this uh, class of model uh, capture uh, the uh, sudden stop in emerging market. And you can think about uh, an application of this class of model also in terms of a sudden stop rather than in international creative market, a sudden stop in domestic creative market. So it would be similar logic. And from a normative perspective, an earlier paper by Javier and also other works by Jean and Korinek look at the rational for uh, exante intervention or macroprudential policy. Now, the interesting thing of this class of model is that uh, the presence of the occasionally binding constraint also allow you, allow you to uh, study the interaction between policy that you put in place in crisis time and policy that you put in place in normal times. And this is actually what I'm going to say here in most of my discussion is I'm going to emphasize that this is important. The, key intera the, the interaction between ex post and ex ante policy is important in order to understand the design of ex ante policy. Now, in my discussion, I'm going first to focus on the methodologic part of the paper in which uh, I will uh, clarify uh, what uh, is meant here by uh, constraint efficient social planner problem. And I will uh, uh, compare it with uh, optimal policy problem. Um, and then I will offer a, an interpretation of the results that is uh, uh, slightly different from uh, what Javier has, uh, has proposed. And then uh, there are some small comments uh, that I might not have time to go through uh, in terms of robustness of the quantitative analysis and other small comments, as I said. So the policy analysis here is uh, usually conducted by comparing the competitive or the centralized equilibrium allocation uh, with a social planner allocation, where the social planner face the same financial friction as private agents in the unregulated economy. And this is defined as constraint efficient social planner problem. And actually, Guido has a paper that inspired, I guess, most of this, uh, uh, this literature that uh, has followed in terms of uh, the normative analysis of this class of model. Now, the other approach is the approach that uh, I've been uh, uh, proposing with uh, my co-authors in which uh, we look at the uh, optimal policy approach uh, in the sense that uh, what uh, you would do here is that you would maximize agents utility as here, subject to private agents first order condition, condition on a given policy tool. And this, uh, we did it uh, also in, the, uh, in a time consistent uh, equilibrium and also in a Ramsey problem for a special economy, which is an endowment economy. So now in this paper here, uh, so the paper, as I said, is a very interesting and also very rich. And there are a lot of uh, subtleties. And uh, the one, one aspect here that is of interest, of course, the issue of time consistency consistency that uh, can arise for different reasons in this class of model, depending on what uh, you put in the collateral constraint. Here, the collateral constraint de depends on this forward-looking asset price, and uh, the, uh, uh, that is a source of time consistency. Now, I'm going to do, a, in order to clarify this distinction between uh, constraint efficient problem and optimal policy problem, I'm going to briefly review all these approaches here. And I'm going to use a simplified version of the general setup that uh, Javier has in the paper. So this is actually what uh, I guess uh, uh, Javier did in a previous paper and also Anton Korinek did in uh, his work that is inspired by Guido's uh, paper. So essentially, the constrained social planner problem would maximize agent's utility subject to the resource constraint to the borrowing constraint that also private agents face. And uh, then you need to do something here because you need to determine this asset price that enters in the constraint. And you assume one way to close this uh, problem is to assume that the asset price is determined as if you were in the competitive equilibrium allocation. Okay? So this would be the first uh, way of doing it. Uh, 
Uh, and we discussed that uh, uh, why there are some issues related to this way of doing it. Now, in this paper, Javier and uh, Enrique do something slightly different. So they maximize the same utility. Uh, I call it the Constraints Social Planner 2. That's, uh, they call it Constraints Social Planner. I call it 2 because it's an expanded version of the previous one, which maximizes utility subject to the same resource constraint, the same borrowing constraint, then there is the complementary slackness condition that comes from the private agents problem. And then there are also the other first order condition that comes from the private agents problem in terms of the optimal choice of imported input. And also another implementability condition, as they call, which is the equation that determines the asset price. Okay? So this is the expanded version in which they take into account some constraint that comes from the first order condition of the uh, individual optimization in the regulated economy. Okay? Now, if you look at carefully at this constraint here, and how would you do actually first in, uh, to solve this problem? What you do is that, you essentially what you do is that you find a tax tool that would implement the previous allocation. Constraint efficient one or constraint efficient two. Now, what I argue is that essentially when you do this, uh, what you're doing is that, uh, in particular in this second problem, what you're doing is that you are restricting the set of policy tool to a tax on debt. And uh, I'll show you what would be the optimal policy in which you have a tax on debt. So I write down now a third problem, which is the optimal policy problem, in which you maximize utility subject to the resource constraint, the borrowing constraint, the complementary slackness condition, and private agents first order condition. This would be equivalent to Javier paper. And then I add also the Euler equation of the agents that is not there. Okay? If I add the Euler equation, then I will have also the tax on borrowing. Okay? Now, what you can see from here is that uh, if I take out this equation, right, what do I do? I maximize this, I find all the quantities, then I plug them here, and I recover tau b. Okay? So this problem here that is called constraint efficient is optimal Ramsey problem. Here I'm not uh, entering in the issue of time consistency. Is the optimal Ramsey problem conditional on having tau b as the policy tool. Now, how is that? Why is that happening here? So that I explained, but the one key assumption is that the balance, the budget is balanced through lump sum taxes or transfer. If you have uh, distortionary financing, then you cannot take out the Euler equation. I mean, you, you, you can take out the Euler equation, but you're gonna have taxes in another equation, so the problem will be different. Okay, so this is what is called constraint social planner two. I would call it optimal policy with tax on debt. Okay, now there is an interesting aspect of this uh, is that in the general model, this optimal policy has both ex ante, so micro prudential component, and also ex post, crisis ma what I call crisis management component. Now, I'm going to ask two questions. Uh, so th the first bullet point is actually quite interesting. And there are some interesting aspects related to the exposed policy intervention that I don't have the time to discuss in details, but are related to the way the social planner and private agents differ in terms of valuing the uh, possibility of relaxing the constraints. So it's, uh, it's a tricky bit. But I'm going to ask two more two questions here. To what extent this is the best policy tool to address what we have here, the market failure that you have in this model, and also what is actually the rationale for uh, macroprudential intervention in this class of model. So in terms of best policy tool, I, it's not the best policy tool. Actually, what you could do, and I did it here, it's very simple, you can uh, prop up asset price. And uh, if you subsidize asset price, you find the minimum uh, level of the asset price such that the constraint is just binding, and you find the optimal tau that will uh, basically undo the constraint. What you achieve when you do that, you achieve the unconstrained allocation. 
Um, so that would be the uh, best policy tool. A tax on, uh, or it's actually it's a subsidy on, uh, on asset price that you implement when the constraint binds. What happens in this class of model is that when you do that, agents will know that and will behave as if the constraint is not binding or is just binding. There is actually another policy tool that I think could do better than the tax on debt, which I, I haven't tried that, so I'm not 100% sure, but my conjecture based on how the model works would say that also a subsidy of imports when the constraint binds will also probably improve upon the optimal tax on debt that is suggested here. So if you do the optimal policy problem, conditional on different uh, policy tool, you might find higher welfare than this uh, uh, optimal tax on debt. Why is that? And this is what I'm going to explain next. Essentially, the logic comes from what you do when the crisis occur and how that affects the behavior of agent ex ante. And when that affects the behavior of agent ex ante, so in normal times, that also change the design of policy in normal times. So there is this interaction that I was trying to emphasize earlier between ex post and ex ante uh, intervention that is crucial in this class of model. Now I'm gonna use, uh, just to explain a little bit how that happens, I'm gonna use the figure that is in the, two figures that are in the paper. So the, the, I, I've yet described it very well, but what, what happens here essentially? Why in this, uh, in this characterization and this comparison between these two allocation, you, you're gonna do, you're gonna impose a tax on debt. You're gonna do that because if you look at the gap between the social planner and the competitive equilibrium allocation when the constraint binds, which is this part of the graph here, those two are very close, okay? So it means that uh, essentially when there is a crisis, you don't move up much from the competitive equilibrium allocation. So on a, another way, in some limit case, essentially the crisis is almost efficient according to these uh, efficient criteria that you use. And uh, you can see it also from the behavior of asset prices here. This would be the asset price in the competitive equilibrium allocation. This is the asset price in the social planner allocation. Actually, what you want to do is that you want to do the opposite. You don't want to go below, you want to go above here. This is a natural economy that wants to borrow more because agents are relatively impatient. That's what, uh, what happens here. Um, now, how do you interpret this? And what is the, the policy and what is the logic behind optimal policy in this uh, class of model? Uh, the optimal policy would try to limit the uh, uh, effectiveness or uh, the damage caused by the pecuniary externality. And what you want to do is that you want to relax the borrowing constraint when the constraint binds. Uh, we refer to this class of policy as price support policy, depending on what is the key market price that enters the constraint. So that could be the asset price, it could be a real exchange rate, or it could be housing price or whatever price enters into the constraint, it creates this inefficiency. You want to support it when it binds. So for example, emerging market economy, when there is a crisis, they want to limit the depreciation of the currency because this uh, depreciation create this amplification mechanism through liability dollarization and make the crisis even worse. Now, what is the rationale in this class of model in our interpretation for policy intervention, ex ante? The rationale depends on the extent to which you don't have the right policy tool or the policy tool that you have exposed are costly to put in place. So, Essentially what I say here is that the rational, for example, policy intervention depends on the effectiveness of exposed policy tool. So if policy tool exposed are not effective, so the two lines are very close to each other, then you want to do something ex ante. But if you are able, or uh, it's cost free to do something when <laughs> the crisis occur, then uh, you might well not do something ex ante because you're gonna limit the damage of the crisis later on. Now, there is a lot of emphasis in the paper on the extent to which there is overborrowing in this economy. And I want to challenge this interpretation because to me the problem of this uh, economy, not uh, the, the real world, but of this economy, is uh, not overborrowing, but it's uh, the allocation of resources more generally. It's not the size of debt that is a problem here, but uh, where credit flows are going. So, in, uh, in this context here, 
it's an intertemporal allocation that matters. Uh, and uh, you can prop up asset price <laughs> allocating in a better way consumption, and that will solve the problem. In another case, maybe an intratemporal allocation that matters between different types of consumption. For example, in our paper, that will uh, stimulate uh, the real exchange rate and undo the constraints. So there are different ways in which uh, these can be interpreted, but it's not an issue uh, of a size of borrowing, but it's an issue of where these credit flows are going. And that, uh, in fact, if, you f if they go in the right direction, if they go properly, then you will undo the problem that is in this model economy. There are other few things that um, I think are coming from, uh, from the paper that I think are very interesting. First of all, uh, what I would do is that I try to explore more the finding on the non prudential component that uh, you kind of uh, put it aside in the paper and it's quantitatively small. My sense is that it depends a little bit on the calibration and I suggest here a way in which you can, uh, or one parameter that I think would be crucial for, uh, for understanding that. Um, and also, ideally, but I know that that is very difficult, you want to also explore the commitment solution uh, quantitatively. You just uh, lay out the, the problem, but that I know because we've been working on this for, for years. It's, it's a difficult problem to solve the, the, commitment, the commitment case. So let me just uh, uh, conclude here. I think that this is a, it's a very good paper uh, that uh, um, it's very rich and uh, extremely carefully done. And as, as I said, it's a state of the art on uh, this optimal time consistent uh, macroprudential uh, policy. I, I would, as I said, or uh, hopefully came across in my discussion, try to explore more the, uh, the potential of the model in terms of the uh, normative analysis and its interpretation. So thank you. Uh, so to clarify, I don't want to say that macroprudential policy, you know, in this class of models is the only uh, welfare improving policies, you know, I, I know from some of your work that there are other, uh, other, other policies that, that could work. Um, but what the data seems to suggest is that um, governments, when they are in a crisis, they try really hard to, uh, to take the economy out of the crisis, but it seems like it's really hard. And, and that, I think, calls for, for thinking about also prudential policies. So a technical issue is that, so, so intuitively what we want to do is the following. OK, what is, we want to investigate where, whether there is overborrowing. So what we do is we replace the, the borrowing decisions by households and give it to the planner. So that, that's, that's what we're doing. The only decision the planner makes directly is the level of debt. Here, in the planner, the households continue to choose their consumption, their, their labor, and, and, and that, that gives rise to a uh, market clearing price for, for, for capital. So I think, it's a, I, I think it's a very natural way to approach it, um, but you know, it's, it's not the only one. I agree that you would subsidize uh, dividends, then you, you could relax the constraint, now there's of course some limitations. Just if you think about uh, distortionary taxes, would be the easiest one. If you if you want to pop up asset prices, but you also have to to introduce a, a distortionary tax, then it's I think it's clear that um, that you won't fully relax the constraint, which means that ex ante there will still be a scope for. Uh, for macroprudential policy or, or taxes on debt um, that, that we analyze. Um, but the tax on debt is just one implementation of the, of the constraint efficient allocations. Uh, there could be others um, using loan to value ratios, for example. So the tax is just, a, uh, is just a one way to, to decentralize it. And we could also give the planner more, uh, more choices. We are restricting the planner to use, to control the amount of debt. If the planner could also control um, uh, labor decisions or, or inputs, then I agree there could be other interesting in interactions. But we really want to put a lot of constraints on what the planner can do 
uh, meaning they can only choose borrowing, and, and then see w whether that, that is, is sufficient to, to, to include welfare and to reduce uh, <coughs> financial fragility. We have time for a couple of questions. Um, so for a short time, I propose we have the questions and then you answer all of them. It would be, I think it would be interesting to see uh, other policy tools too. So it sounds like almost what you have in mind is uh, you know, adding, adding additional collateral constraints or collateral requirements during good times and relaxing them. I mean, adding commentary is a requirement, but that, that what you have can be cast in that form. It would be interesting to see how that works out. And then in point of the comments, I was thinking, you know, maybe that's where you are sharing that in mind with the with subsidizing <coughs> the so subsidizing stock price is kind of like tar, right? Or an asset purchase program. I mean, it's sort of, I guess what happens here is you have a constraint that's, that's defined in terms of the market price, and the market price is just something we agree upon. It's not something that's sort of in the, in the allocation, it's, it's just the price. So, so we kind of could just go and say, you know, different price, and then we like this avoiding constraint. I guess that needs to be almost a lot in there. Further questions? Yeah, thank you. In essence, this is basically putting in a dampening term in, in some type of like either circuit, electrical circuit, mechanical circuit. You're putting a shock absorber or dampening in a, a dampening term uh, to even things out. But anytime you put a dampening device in, aren't you creating some wasted energy or wasted heat? Something's wasted. Okay, I agree it would be interesting to explore this, these other policies. Um, so in our model, the, the asset price needs to satisfy uh, an implementability constraint. So it's not, you know, it's not free to, to set the price, you know, the plan I would like. But, but you could, I mean, what I'm assuming is that the only margin is the, pl is, is the, is the choice of debt. But I agree, if, you, if we allow the planner perhaps to buy assets, something like the TARP, or you know, we could, we could analyze that, but still we would be in a case where there's going to be an implementability constraint because the asset price still needs to satisfy some, uh, you know, some market clearing conditions and optimality conditions, but there would be other policy instruments that would be affecting, you know, the, those, those implementability constraints. I agree it would be very interesting. Thank you very much.